the wall within. I think this is an important pathwork lecture that's often referred to. And um, it's about, about a lot of things, but one of the things it's about is two levels of hypocrisy, you know? Um, the guide always talks about how there's a difference between people who are on the path of self-facing, on a spiritual path, and people who are not, right? I mean, more, pe more is to be expected of people who are seekers uh, than of people that are not. And um, when the guy talks in the first page about um, the desire for goodness coming from the lower self and the higher self, and about the ways that people hide their lower self in the good that they're ostensibly doing, I think that applies to a lot of people, right? And then later on in the lecture, the guy talks about how people employ various uh, ways of evading their own responsibility to their own spiritual path. So in the beginning, the guide says, every human being desires to strive for perfection, for the ability to love and for true goodness, for light and truth. And of course, that means everybody, right? You know, Vladimir Putin, everybody. Everybody desires to strive for perfection, for the ability to love and for true goodness, for light and truth. The question is though, what people are prepared to believe about their quest for light and truth. So when a lot of unconscious motivations are hidden behind what the guide calls the wall within, you're able to justify almost anything, I think, in the name of your desire to strive for perfection, for the ability to love and for true goodness. So this desire lives in the divine spark of every being, but its pure state, in its pure state, it does not always penetrate all the layers of imperfection that surround the spark. We see it as though the sun were shining through dirty glass and the rays coming out on the other side took on hazy shades. You know, that reminds me a lot of the passage in uh, Corinthians where it says, um, you know, now we see us through a glass darkly, but then we shall see face to face. Um, now we, you know, we have imperfect knowledge, but then everything will be known. So, I think it's helpful to think about the idea that every being desires perfection, the ability to love and for goodness, but that desire is filtered through a light or heavy glass that makes it obscure and makes the striving obscure, but it is there, right? In everyone. Okay. so. On the first page, the guide talks about hypocrisy. I mean, that's when you do one of two things. You either try to paper over your selfishness. Um, you try to gloss over the layer where you're acting out of selfish reasons. You're trying to justify it. Um, you can either Um, yeah, there, there are two things you can do. You can either accept the fact that you're imperfect or you can gloss it over. And um, the guide says many people are in that category. On page two, he says, Either on a path like this, you can try in a spirit of understanding and humility to accept oneself as one is and accept one's inability to change as yet, or rationalize, justify, and self-righteously explain harboring such evil or unkind impulses while seeking self-justification in the shortcomings of others. So, and I think, you know, what awakens you to the difference is 
uh, the, um, the conscience, you know, when you feel something is wrong, you feel that something is not quite right. And that's a prompt for you to look deeper, to look within. And I think that everybody who's on a spiritual path has felt that stirring of conscience, where you start questioning your motives and you're prepared to take the courageous step to feel them, to face up to them, to acknowledge them. After all, that's really what the path work is. The guide always reca recaps that. Page one, the first step is always to recognize the meaning of your various desires, motives, and feelings. From there on, the path becomes easier. So this is really the theme of all the lectures really, and of course this lecture. The idea here in, in this lecture is that a lot of our motivations and feelings are behind what the guide calls the wall within. And our activity in raising our consciousness is to try to take these things from one side of the wall to the other. And it begins with self-acceptance, the acceptance that we're not perfect the acceptance that our motivations are not perfect. And, and from there, we can go ahead and, and go forward and, and try to reckon with it. So what is this wall that the guide talks about, this wall within? He says, whenever the conscious emotions, opinions, thoughts, conclusions, and desires are separated from those which are unconscious, we can see a wall in the human soul. You all know that thoughts and feelings create forms of subtle matter, which are of a substance every bit as real as your material substance. So this wall is a reality and it lasts often a greater reality than your matter. For your matter is much easier to destroy than some of these walls. That's an interesting phrase, I think, you know. You can't help thinking about the walls that are being destroyed in the Ukraine, you know? And it's easy to destroy those walls, right? All it takes is a tank shell. All it takes is a bomb and those walls are gone. But the walls that we erect within to protect ourselves from understanding or apprehending more of ourselves, those are very, very difficult to dismantle. You know, those take a lifetime to dismantle. Those are very tenacious walls. And of course, where do the walls come from? They come from wrong conclusions. Those are the images. I guess whenever one has an image about something, it's behind the wall. What is the spiritual substance of this wall, my friends? For a spiritual substance is not a material that you use because you choose it, as when you build a form in your material world. You make this choice of material according to taste and necessity, but the material has nothing to do with you. Spiritual substance, on the other hand, is the product of your thinking, feeling, and being, and it is formed from them. So the guide makes this point in the lecture that he makes in many lectures, you know, that um, for being anchored in truth, maybe some of us here, but especially for beings in the spiritual realm where the guide is, it's all apparent. You can see everything. They see the wall. We can't change the composition of it. We are who we are. There's, there's no hiding. There's no concealing of who we are. And that's always something that I think about when the guy uses the term we, you know, which are other spiritual entities with the guy that are here to guide us, guide humanity, protect us. Okay, so now the guide says that, what's the purpose of this wall, this wall within? He says, the purpose of the wall is to keep the negative in hiding and one of the motives of this desire is actually misapplied goodwill. So in other words, we don't want to expose our selfish nature. So we try to keep these things hidden out of a desire to appear good or to be good. We don't realize the power that they have over us. There's another component of this wall though that builds it. It consists of cowardice, pride, self-will and impatience. Because we're impatient, you know, with our, our path of self-development, right? We're frustrated. The ego, I suppose I should say, 
the ego is frustrated because we're, we haven't gotten there yet. We're angry that we're not perfect yet. We want things to move faster. So we're prepared to skip steps. And I think a lot of this lecture, The Wall Within, is about skipping steps and leaving things behind the wall because that's the second level of hypocrisy the guy talks about, which is the way that we employ half measures to shortcut our spiritual development uh, on the path. So just to continue on page two, the guy also recaps again what the path work is. He says, as one progresses on the path of self-knowledge and perfection, the one, one slowly begins to take out certain trends and attitudes from behind the wall and transpose them into consciousness. All, you know, all of you know the process by which this is done. It is the work I advocate and teach. In this process, the wall recedes. More comes out from behind the wall. The fewer trends remain locked in. So, you know, it's all about raising consciousness and bringing out what's inside of us. And I want to point out a couple of things, a couple of points that the guy talks about here. He uses the phrase to become naked and empty twice in the lecture. Your spiritual rebirth can occur only after the wall has disappeared. Then your soul stands naked in front of your maker, in front of yourself. For you have to become naked, that naked, that empty, so that divine substance can fill you and take root within yourself. I think that's a very important uh, part of this lecture. Two pages later, page five, he says it again. He says, if you are truly desirous of making the wall crumble to become empty and naked in your soul, then you will feel quite clearly exactly where and in exactly what way your own wall exists. It is always easier to notice it in the other person, but one is utterly unaware about it in oneself. Next paragraph, the guide refers to the image finding teams that people were working in in, that, in those early days of the path work. This lecture was, was given in 1959. So, you know, I have to say, my friends, that the experience of becoming naked and empty is, I think, really crucial to the path work. And that's why I regret that here, us in this group, you know, it's not easy to become naked and empty in a lecture study group on Zoom. Um, when we had our pathwork groups in the center or in New York, you know, and people met regularly um, every, every week or every two weeks for three hours, and then people could really expose themselves in a community of people that cared and loved them. And when you become naked and empty in front of other spiritual seekers, it's a wonderful feeling. I mean, you, you, you feel a tremendous bond between yourself and everyone else. And the reason for that is very straightforward. The reason is, is because everyone is committed to finding their truth. And when you see other people's truths, it's beautiful. And you can't help but respond to it and react to it and empathize with it. So what the guide says about becoming naked and empty so that divine substance can fill you, that's a really important part of the path work. And you know, if it's not possible to do it on Zoom, it's possible to do it with a pathwork helper or with a group. So that's an experience that I had that I really value and I'll remember for the rest of my life of being that way, feeling that way. So everyone should, should aspire to encounter other people in that way, in that very truthful way. And the way that that happens is by exposing what's behind the wall within. You are able to lift out what's there. You know, I remember uh, this game I played when I was a kid where you have a little fishing rod and you're kind of fishing for things behind a curtain. 
but with a magnet and you don't know what you're going to get. So the magnet gets something and you pull it up and it might be like a nice thing. It might be a sea monster. It might be something nice. It might be a foot or a shoe rather, a, a boot. It's like, um, you know, you're fishing for things. That reminded me a little bit of the wall within, you know, that you're, you're kind of fishing behind a curtain and you can't see what's on the other side. Um, so that's the, what the lecture is about. It's about, again, raising consciousness. So, so Alan, I have one question. Does the guy yeah. tell you, how do you feel that wall? Because it's hard to see it within yourself. How do you sense it? How do you feel it? Well, I mean, what you don't want to face is behind the wall. Maybe I can oh, say okay. that. What you're uncomfortable with is behind, your images are a guide to what's behind the wall. The images are things that you don't want to face or that you have wrong conclusions about. Maybe you can clarify this a little bit, Tracy, what you think, how you feel the wall, that separating wall. What do you think? Okay, hold on. I just had to put it on, get, get it off mute. So I think um, for me, well, well, first of all, I, want, I, I just want to say that next month we're going to be meeting in person. So right. I'll be looking forward to seeing you guys in, 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 in our apartment in New York City again. I miss being with you all. Um, Joel and I are very fortunate in that we're both serious path workers and we spend every day a lot of time sort of confessing, if you will, to, to the other one about these little pings that we see or, or, or something that could even be, you know, much more than a ping when, when we, we wanted the two of us or both of us get out of line. So it does really help to be able to um, be with somebody who is also committed to the, to the path that we're all on. But how I feel the wall is, well, before I say, so there's the other thing, one thing about the lecture that I found very um, hopeful was that again, it, it basically emphasized one of the main precepts of the pathwork, which is that the mere observation of one's faults, images, wrong conclusions, knots, whatever you want to call them, will cause him to pixelate, to, to plagiarize Marion's words. So I found that to be true. And, and I, I, when I first read that first, it must be 10 years ago now, the guide says in one of the early lectures that I read, the me, and I quote, the mere observation will, will cause the, you know, the, 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 the fault to start to become less of a knot. And so I can feel this wall when I hit up against, it, it pains me. So I, I, I've spent a lot of time in observation of myself. And when I, when I first started doing that 10 years ago, I, I spent two or three years in a very heightened state of pain that was physical. I felt like I was walking around with a dagger in, in my gut because naturally, or maybe not naturally, but for me anyway, what I saw when I started to really look truthfully at myself was a lot of unpleasantness. And I had not been aware of the extent of the negativity that was that was within me behind my wall whatever way you want to describe it until i started to really just spend a lot of time every day in honest self observation and it was shocking to me at first and also extremely painful but the good news is i mean i, I always say to Joel i'm only one rat study i just kept at it and it, it, it did start, well, first of all, it did, those things did start to pixelate. And the other thing is it became much in, easier and easier and easier to just see it, to see the things that weren't pleasant to look at. Were you, so uh, I feel the wall, I feel the wall in a very, in a very physical way because what, what, what's still behind, what I still can't face 
at this point, I can kind of see it, but it's it's still back there behind the Great Wall of China, and and I and I can get a glimpse of it, and then I of course retreat because it's too distasteful and painful to look at. But it feels like um, almost like I'm funny. It almost feels like I'm hitting a wall because I I, I get I see it like kind of to use your analogy about like looking over the curtain and seeing what your magnet's going to pick up, and what's left back there is you know, the stuff that's been the most difficult, obviously, for me to fish out because the, the easier stuff is now in front of the wall. Right. So I, I, I sort of move backwards from it. Joel's got his hand up. So you oh, want to- let, uh, let me welcome Barbara, a love liner to our, our, our circle tonight. Hi, Barbara. Uh, Long time path worker. Um, nice to see you. Anyway, Joel, did you want to say something? No, he's asking me to give an example of something that's behind the wall. So, something that was behind the wall that came to you in daily experience, and that and that you then were able to bring into the into your conscious. Okay, so I mean, this is I, I, he wants me to give an example. So, here uh, we live in a in in a in a plate in a Caribbean island. And um, for the winter, and there, my, it, it, about a month ago, our, my daughter, our daughter, and our grandson and her husband were visiting for, for a short period. And our grandson is uh, two and a half, and there was a little boy that he was playing with here a lot, who was a few years older. And then I would was in the habit of like uh, fetching them from the camp that they were in together around four, and taking them down to the beach, and one day I, 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 so I had these two, oh, and the one boy is black and my grandson is, he's white, but he's also very white. He's light, he's very light, like, like I am. And um, I was walking through the pool area and I had these two little boys, one of them in each hand and I, and I felt this niggle. And I, so I knew immediately, like, you know, it's like this, like, and I couldn't figure out what it was. It was like, but there was, but I knew there was something because I, this like, it's like a niggle. It's like an uncomfortable, like uh, feeling inside of my gut. Like, you know, and I was like, what, well, you know, and, and I was trying to figure out what it, and I never ignore it anymore because I know if I get the, I call them pings, but niggles, what, I mean, it doesn't matter what we're, so I knew there was something there. And I was like, well, what am I doing? You know, I'm just walking, you know, going to the beach with these two babies. And then all of a sudden, and I kept working with it and working, and all of a sudden I was, I was proud. And I was so shocked. I was proud that I was walking with a black boy and a white boy. And I was so shocked because my entire life, I have believed that I'm an, ex that I'm an extremely unprejudiced person about color, religion, sexual orientation, those kinds of things. And yet, I had to have some underlying prejudice or, or feeling of, you know, something that I would feel proud that I had a white boy and a black boy with me. And I didn't, so I just, okay, I saw it and I was like, wow, okay, that was like shocking to me. So shocking to me. And, um, and I just, you know, okay, Tracy, I, you know, and I, so that was hidden, very, very hidden behind that wall. And I, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't beat myself up about it. I didn't like, you know, self-flagellate. I also didn't try to explain it away, justify it, you know, whatever, or do any of the tricks that the lower self can do, which is, well, at least I was, you know, at least I was, you know, with the, you know, I didn't just, I just observed it. And then a few days later, I was in exactly the same position, got the boys, walking through the pool area to take them to the beach. And, and I, and it was gone. And I thought of Marion right then and there, because she has always said, and I love her verb, that the mere, that when you observe it without justifying it, trying to explain it away, uh, especially without condemning yourself, that the mere observation will cause these things to pixelate. And I was so shocked that just a few days later, I was walking and I just, I, I didn't feel anything. I just was like walking to the beach with, with two boys, but that's the kind of a thing that would have been so 
far behind my wall, I would have been, if you had asked me, I would have said, absolutely not. I have no prejudice. I mean, I was raised, I mean, with the very important thing in my family, you know, I was taught from the time I was old enough to even remember that all people are equal. There is no difference because of, you know, color of one's skin or religion or financial status or sexual. I was taught that from the time I can, what was in diapers, but there was still some piece of me that obviously, otherwise I wouldn't have felt proud. I would have felt nothing. I would have felt nothing. So I was so, I was, I, so I, so to answer your question, I felt it. I felt a little niggle, something that kind of made me kind of squirm inside my, inside of myself where, where I, I, oh, you know, I, I, it's like you're, you're kind of squirming in your seat, but you're not really squirming physically, but that's what it feels like. Mm. So I, I knew it was there because otherwise I wouldn't have gotten that ping. I wouldn't have got that niggle. So I guess that's how I feel it. Well, I guess that's the classic kind of thing that you'd, you'd identify in a daily review, right? <clears throat> yes. That caused some disharmony. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think that's, that's good. I mean, that's something that when we get triggered by something, then something's behind the wall that we don't want to face. The guide says on page five, he says, the unconscious is congenitally opposed to giving up its subterfuges. It considers coming out into the open a grave danger. It is ignorant and draws utterly erroneous conclusions in this respect as in many others. Therefore, it is opposed to let the wall crumble and cocks all sorts of ruses to prevent you from working in this direction, no matter how good your intentions may be. Mm. All right. Yeah, Juan. Let me just, yeah, let me just contribute a little bit there, a little to uh, uh, Teresa, uh, Teresa's questions, actually, because the guide uh, indeed answers that question right on page three. On paragraph four, uh, he says, uh, so my dear friend, all of you who work on this path so successfully, visualize this wall within yourself. You can find it in meditation. You will sense it by observing your reactions and you will then know where the wall stands. After locating it, it will be much easier for you to finally succeed in eliminating it altogether. So yeah, Tracy had a great point there by observation, by meditating and you know, by meditation and uh, just by really observing those reactions when they come out to the surface of our awareness uh, from those hidden places where they are um, you know, behind those, the wall where they are located. So yeah, so it's just very, uh, very interesting that he actually um, hit the nail right on the head there. Does anyone have a sense of this wall within, how it feels? Any, oh. any thoughts about that? This is, this is Marion, may I speak? Sure, Marion, go ahead. Um, well, thank you both, Tracy and Juan. That's the exact paragraph, Juan, that I was going to say and come and about observation, because somewhere the guide said the first step of transformation is observation. And I keep that in my toolbox as kind of a mantra. And it's kind of put a tune to it. First step of transformation is observation. However, to get to that observation, one has to be willing. So there are some steps to awakening the observer and being open and willing on the energy level. Uh, so it takes a lot of, I think, um, work on the, you know, your main uh, images, images and getting used to them, befriending them, getting to know them. Then one is very open for the observer to come in. And so there is some work before that to do to be so willing uh, to observe. Um, about the wall, um, I'm just going to say something very briefly because I said before the meeting actually started about studying the wall you many years ago. I remember being in a group where we all drew our walls on a piece of paper, you know, and it was fun. And what I noticed about the wall, and it's still, I still work with it because I'm still writing out in my memoir writing uh, classes and groups, uh, still images come up that I've worked on for decades and decades, and there's still remnants there. And the wall 
Like my wall, I remember drawing it years ago, which was such so revelatory, is because it was a wall like a great big backboard, you know, you might have if you're playing uh, handball or something, you know, it was, it was a wall, but I was so close to it, it seemed to go on forever, this wall. And it was so high, I couldn't climb over it. Mm. So the metaphors coming up are very important. And so what happened is, uh, in observing, I took a step back. Well, I'm not willing to take a step back if right away with every wall that I have, but I guess I was willing because I had help with other people in a group. We were doing it together. And that way I was willing to step back. And then I noticed my wall wasn't as long as the Chinese wall, you know, my wall was only like a backboard wall. And then, then I looked, it was in a meadow, like some grassy meadow. I was trying to climb over that wall. I was trying to jump up. It was so high. I didn't have a step ladder. I didn't have any help. And I'm trying to get over that wall. And it wasn't until I stepped back that I saw, well, my wall's only about 10 feet long. I can walk around it. I don't have to keep dropping, trying to jump over this impossibly tall wall. And this feeds into my images, two of them. And I wrote about this week, I have to do everything myself. This is going back to my family, this life. I have to do everything myself. There's nobody who takes care of me, nobody who does it for me, and nobody helps me, and I'm all alone. The second one is I've got to do what everybody else tells me to do. I had to go work in the family drugstore when I was very young. I wasn't given a choice. I was dictated to, and I had to do it. And I was a very rebellious type person, but I kowtowed. So it fits right in with me trying, thinking I've got to climb that wall this, you know, so long because my nose is right next to it. And it wasn't until I observed, hey, it's only 10 feet wide and I can walk around the darn thing. So it's a lot of metaphors that come up around the wall and a lot of preliminary and side-by-side -side work and working with others and some hand-holding through all this. Willingness, I love the word being willing. And that's something I, in my daily prayers, I do say what I'm willing to do today, what I'm willing to look at. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Marion. Yeah, that's very helpful, what I'm willing to look at today. Hey, Beverly, what's your, what's your thinking about the wall within? Any thoughts? Putting you on the spot. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have any specific thoughts. I did think it was a really good lecture. And um, I think I, I totally accept that I'm not perfect. So I'm also very curious to see, okay, so what do we do about that? That's basically my thought. Well, part of the answer, right, of course, is just observing it, right? Because once you observe it, you're on the spiritual path, the path of self-facing. You yeah. know, I can, I clearly see my imperfections. <laughs> totally observe them. Yeah, well, I, I'm afflicted with the idealized self-image. So I, I, I don't want to see them, but I, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the opportunity to see my imperfections. Yeah. Take them up from behind the wall. Well, I finally started accepting it is what it is and to stop trying to fight it. Yeah, it's also very comforting, at least to me, that this concept of thousands of incarnations where it might take you so long, mm. so many lifetimes to purify things, to make things right. It's, uh, I like that. <laughs> I mean, the idea that everything has to be sewed up in this life just seems to me to be, I can't get my head around that. Why would that, why that would be? And that puts a lot of pressure, knowing that you, who you are, you can't do it. You're not going to be able to do it. Sure so. does. It sure does. Yeah. And it's one of those paradoxes, of course, that really doesn't matter because simply by having the more relaxed and laid back attitude toward life, you make progress, even if it is only one life, you make progress anyway, mm -hmm. faster progress, because the very striving against your human nature, you know, handicaps you. Yeah. Can I add something there, Alan? Stephen, yeah, please. Uh, uh, Beverly, uh, you may recall one of the uh, concepts or pieces of information that the um, Pathwork provides us is that we, we are transforming some 
we're, we're not only transforming ourselves in this life, but we may actually volunteer to bring across a baggage, if you would, will, that's not just our own mm. to help to transform it in this life. Um, so I find some comfort in that. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's my lower self deceiving me into thinking that all of my negativity is not just from myself. <laughs> but I do take some comfort in that when I uh, co come up with face to face with with some of some of the unpleasantness <laughs> that I'm not able to, um, to 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 really make much progress on. <laughs> so I just put that out there for. Uh, whatever it's worth to provide some, some comfort. Isn't that right, Alan, that that, that doesn't it, Pathwork speak to that? About the fact, give me, rephrase that for me, if you don't mind. So that we, we carry some baggage of some negativity, uh, if you will, uh, from, from the other side that may not be our, our own, that we volunteered to help to, to bring it into the light and transform it uh, here in this plane. I'm not sure about that. Are you saying that we can take on someone else's karma? I mean, the guy does talk about the concept of karma. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to turn over back to Tracy. Uh, there's one lecture. It's one of the ones at the at the end. I'll see if I can find it. Um, and and then I mean, some of this stuff is looking for it, but I'm I'm 100 percent sure that mm. it exists because I was very surprised when I read this sentence in one of the later lectures, because it specifically said that not only are we coming on with in each incarnation with our own unfinished business, but that there are instances where we, we may volunteer to bring unpurified aspects of consciousness with us that weren't specifically ours. I was so shocked because everything in the pathwork is about, you know, yourself, right. yourself, yourself, but, I'll look for it, you know, this, when I'm looking for the next lecture, it's towards the end. So I'll, I'll see if I can't like, uh, I'll see if I can't find it towards it, you know, uh, anyway, it's, it's only, a, it's only a few sentences in one lecture. And it, it, I just remember being shocked. And I read those few sentences many times and obviously told Joel about them and it, it stuck with him too. Um, well, that's very interesting, Tracy. I mean, of course, the guide always says that our that our work doesn't only help ourselves; it helps out those around us. And you know, the guide kind of kind of gives for gives forth the uh, the concept or that that we're kind of like in a theater with all these entities gathered around who benefit from our work. You know, that's yeah, really yeah, for, that's clear, right? Because right. whatever whatever you are, what you you impact not only just yourself but the everybody around you and every no. all the consciousness around you it's but like, this was very much more specific it was almost like say you'd overcome the ten the a fault like to steal or to lie or something that, that you might actually bring that with you even though you, you know to pure to purify it because you could and i i found it shocking so let me just see if i can find it and then what we can find talk about it very interesting very interesting. We, we tended to carry more than one. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we I'll see what I can do. I mean, it's going to. Guides gonna... warned us or limited us on how much stuff we could bring. Well, yeah, that's a different, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that you don't bring everything with you each time because you can only do, you know, <laughs> you, your plate can only be so full. Yeah, there's a, there's a 40 pound, it's got to be able to fit in the overhead compartment. Yeah, exactly. But this was, this was, this was something else. <laughs> I know it's towards the end, so if I'll, I'll let me look, search around towards the end. Okay, thanks. Hello, Alan. Hi. Hi, Steve. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, right. The uh, should only fit in the overhead compartment. This way, you pay less money. Uh, as far as baggage concerned, the wall. It's it's very interesting because um, I'm I'm here in Florida, and it's kind of like a, well, excuse me. I'm. At times I have to shut the video off. I'm on a so old cell phone. Anyway, um, it, it's it's a, a sort of a gated community, you know, and, and uh, I, I like to walk in the morning and uh, there's just so many ways of walking here and paths. 
And um, I, I've always considered myself as a person who really, I, I'm not perfect, I know, but I'm a lot more perfect than you and everybody else. So I, I, I really don't want to uh, involve myself with too many people certainly not in the morning and to talk to people, oh, at least that's my perception. So I, I kind of create a wall. And as I walk around here, I see people and uh, I say, oh, well, I, I, I don't want to say hello, good morning. And everybody's so jolly and, you know, it's Florida. And um, so I'm always quite amazed when I'm up in New York and then I, I get back down here after about a month or so being in New York. They say, we missed you. How, where were you? We were so worried about you. And I'm thinking like, I don't know. Am I really building this wall that I think I'm building to keep people away? Or is it permeable? I mean, does it have holes? Do they see the real me and I don't? Uh, so it, it's interesting. And, you know, I guess you would call it mindfulness, which is a big word now. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess it comes from Buddhism to some extent, just being mindful. And as I walk around, I, I find if I actually do say hello, it's actually could be quite enjoyable in spite of my, oh, this is going to be really boring. You know, like he's going to discuss, um, I don't know, his hemorrhoids or something, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I, it starts to allow me to see through how I've kept myself apart so many years. And, and I keep reading, you know, we are naturally love and love is our basic way of being, love and, and joy. And I'm thinking, <laughs> Uh, they must have left some parts out of me because I don't not normally feel love. Uh, it's much easier for me to feel, eh, you know, somewhat, I don't know, hatred. I, that used to be a strong word for me, not so much now. Um, indifference, I think, is a better term for me. But yet, when I watch uh, the, the terrible things that are going on in the world, and everybody knows what I'm talking about, there is no indifference. I'm, I'm, I'm really hurt, really, really hurt. And I'm thinking, wow, where's this coming from? Well, maybe it's coming from the fact that I'm human. Mm -hmm. And maybe the wall never really was so thick and permanent as I'd like to believe. Or maybe I'm starting to dissolve it. I don't know, but it's an interesting, um, lecture really the wall um things that you're not yeah. conscious of things you don't want to be aware of those are the things behind the wall i i don't want to feel the compassion for the people in the ukraine i don't want to cry for them it's like, what are you doing? Why are tears coming to your eyes? It's like I'm embarrassed, actually. It's like I'm embarrassed to well, cry. Either a lecture, shame of the higher self. Well, yeah. it's like, you know, and, and what's coming up when I say it is my, my mother saying, big boys don't cry. Mm -hmm. And that's so imbued within me that I've created this wall as not to cry and, and to not show you my compassion. It's easier to show you my anger. Um, but then again, if I'm to really experience my body and experience the feelings, when I do cry, it's, it's, there's a, a look, it's, it's, it releases a lot of pain and anxiety. It just feels better as opposed to the anger that I used to experience. So I think the body really knows underneath it all what's happening, regardless of the, the voices in my head that tell me who I am. So it, it's very good. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Barbara, are you, can you hear me okay? How's it going? Good, good to good to see you, so to speak. Thanks for coming in. 
Barbara is a longtime path worker. Um, I haven't seen you for what, 20 years, maybe? Can't hear you. Can't hear you still. You need to unmute, you're muted. You're, Barbara, you're muted. I thought I unmuted. There you go. Okay. There you go. Oh, okay. Go. Uh, yeah. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I said, I think it's gotta be longer than 20 years. Maybe, um, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, quite a while. Um, my, uh, I'm just thinking, I think my daughter's like 40 years old and I think that um, I hadn't been around so much. Yeah, I remember carrying the baby, I remember you carrying the baby around, I think. Mm -hmm, well, mm -hmm. You remember Marion, yeah. of course. I do, Marion lives in my uh, neighborhood, hi, and we <laughs> bump into each other sometimes <laughs> and she gets my art um, mm -hmm. notices. So um, yeah, I have been thinking about the path work um, and curious about it. I, I also, I, I know Bar Marianne Barcelona, she's also an old time. I see her uh, because we're part of like the same uh, art community. Uh, I'm, an, I'm an artist. Um, and um, matter of fact, that's one of the things, I mean, it's, it, I don't know, this is kind of weird to share, but I, um, I have a, um, an art book club and we just recently read a book about um, four artists um, rivalry pairs. And the last pair was, um, um, uh, um, oh boy, I'm blanking on his name, Willem de Kooning and um, um, Jackson, what's his name? Uh, Pollock? Um, yeah, Jackson Pollock, right. And so it was reminding me of Ruth Kligman and it was just, like, you know, it seems like kind of like a bizarre thing, but then um, I saw, you know, I had like looked into the path work and, oh, oh, I know, I hope you don't mind. I'm just stream of no. consciousness. The, the thing before this that had me thinking about the path work, I, um, I just have started doing, in January, I started a project, a, an upcycling project where I was um, making a version of prayer flags out of um, recycled materials. And um, so part of this um, making them, and they're, and they're actually, I just installed them yesterday. They're gonna be hanging in um, right outside a gallery in Chelsea. But part of um, making them was um, sort of like meditating on um, goodwill and loving kindness, um, you know, sort of like following the Buddhist practice. Um, for myself and then for my family and then for people I know and then you know the world in general and so this you know process of making them since January um, is sort of like a private performative practice of, of doing this and I had a feeling that I really wanted to somehow reach a larger audience. You know, I like, I have an email blast list. I know Marion gets my email blasts and I get responses and people come to shows when I have them. But, I, you know, part of me felt like I, I would love to, you know, get this message out more. And so I know someone um, who's a performance artist who has um, a website called the Interior Beauty Salon. And he's a wonderful, heartfelt man and he does I just I love his projects and I reached out to him um hoping that I could possibly interest him in like somehow helping to promote um this project and you know like and I guess the idea of being able to have it you know reach a wider audience and so in my reaching out to him uh, he asked me some questions about my spiritual background and I told him about the path work. You know, this is just, this is all through email. So that was the first thing that sort of like got me going of thinking like path work, I, you know, let me think more about that. We're, you know, it's very much for me, um, this feeling when I um, think of my past with the path work is being able to connect with a very, visceral place inside which is this visceral place of knowing and so he but his answer back to me he was just so thrilled and interested to know about the path work this is someone who has like um a very wide um 
mm-hmm. spiritual practice mm-hmm. and, and knowledge. So um, anyway, getting back to myself, I think that you know, in relating to the, the wall within, I think part of my wall is this feeling of, you know, like, yes, I, I do these art projects, I want to reach out with them, and that they have a lot of meaning, and I feel that they can um, touch people. But I think that my wall has to do with um, ego, in the sense of, you know, like, um, uh, you know, wanting, um, you know, like that conflict of like wanting to, you know, sort of like be um, praised for what I'm doing as versus, you know, as a gift. So I think that's kind of my sharing. Thank you. Well, it sounds like the idealized self-image, you know, where uh-huh. you know, be admired and valued in a way that's not totally, com- you know, that, that makes you stressed out you know, mm-hmm. something like that. But I mean, the wall is, the wall hides negative aspects of the unconscious that we don't want to, to face. That's what the guide says. Um, the purpose of the wall is to keep the negative in hiding. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Well, the, well, then I guess maybe it, the, the, the negative would be maybe, you know, jealousy for other people sure. who do sure. get, Those kinds who of do get the do, who do get the praise, sure, who, who sure. seem to be, you know, have something that I want. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Ellen, do you want to say something? Teresa? Ellen? Yeah, I, I would like to speak a little bit, um, but I, this is one of these moments where, and, and, I, and I've had these with a couple of the lectures, um, where I feel, I, I feel criticized. <laughs> and I feel like the tone of the lecture is like punitive, you know, and pointing at almost like a feeling of original sin. And, um, but, but I also want to say that one of the, one of the, one of the interesting issues for me, even, you know, in terms of my commitment to any, you know, particular path and, you know, I've come to these meetings because I really value what I experience here and, and, um, but I also, uh, feel like it's very hard for me to understand a single path. And I even find this in music. I'm, no, I'm learning and I'm, I'm um, in, in my uh, in my path as a musician. And you know, I, I kind of have a lifelong I'm work, you know, working on being a better musician for my whole life, because my process was kind of aborted. And even with that, it's like I have to play a bunch of different songs and I've got to look at things from many, many different angles for me to understand anything. And um, so uh, and I, and I want to be incoherent, but I also want to uh, um, guess Joel, which when Joel said um, that it was, ga- you know, it gave him solace to think that we carry, you know, that we, um, that it's not just our stuff, but that we, uh, we carry stuff from our ancestors. And this is something that is in a lot of paths that I have come across and it's been very powerful to me that all of our image and like we talk about images or many of our images are things that have been handed down and have come through the generations and um, they and, and I have also heard and people talk about that we can actually heal back in time. And so here's another concept. I think it's in the path work, but certainly many different, you know, spiritual paths say that we're one. We're all one. Doesn't the path work also say that we're all one? Well, Some what do you mean by that? And that's sort of, I mean, in other words, that, well, you know, um, it's interesting because I think the path work, um, you know, we say the path work is a combination of Eastern and Western philosophy. 
Mm -hmm. But in a certain way, the pathwork is very individualistic, very Western. In other words, the pathwork talks about the great responsibility that each of us has to develop him or herself. Um, the pathwork doesn't, I would think, kind of resist the concept that we will merge into a greater consciousness. As far as I can see, the pathwork kind of upholds the individual as irreducible or eternal, more like you know, classical Christianity. Um, and when you say we're all one, you know, the guide says that, you know, not to use a bad metaphor, but like snowflakes are all are not identical, right? <coughs> Everyone has <coughs> their special unique aspects to give, to bring into this spiritual path or, or the world. Everyone has their special and unique aspects. What do you mean by, by saying that there's one? But there's another realm, right? It doesn't talk about the realm of spirit, that there is a different, I mean, that we're dealing with our incarnation into physical life, but there's, there's the, you know, that, so I guess this, this is where, I mean, I feel like I remember it being made reference to, you know, that there's a realm of spirit. Well, I think that the guide in the pathwork, as, as far as I can see, the <clears throat> individual remains discreet even in the realm of spirit i mean the guide is an individual that no longer has to incarnate that has a task to help us grow and so in other words the idea is that if we are liberated from the need to incarnate <clears throat> we remain as individuals um i mean i guess i i see the pathwork as saying that Everyone has the divine spark, of course, but you know the divine spark is not identical, you know, in nature. In other words, everyone is still remains themselves. Um, but when you when you say we're all one, I mean, I think that that's very true in very in many ways. In other words, we all have the same objectives. We're all trying to return to God, right? I mean, we're all trying to. Um, struggle back up from the fall, you know, where we, because of our pride or because of whatever, um, our, our blindness, our separateness, we separated from God and now we're all trying to get back there. So in that sense, we're all one. Yes. Yes, I mean, I have, a, I guess I, you know, I have a lot of, you know, I've spent a lot of years in like study of various, you know, various different types of things and like I guess quantum physics is a big thing in my head and you know Hindu thought and Buddhist thought and new age thought and you know so I always think of it that you know at some other level you know that you know I've read and heard different paths and say you know that there's just like a paradox you know that we are the light you know like the light began us and that we're like at some level we're all that light and I guess those are things that really resonate for me, you know, that, that it's some level, like they're saying that we're striving for perfection. And it's like, uh, well, the only perfection is in spirit. And like when you hear people who have, again, are referencing, you know, I referenced this last week a little bit, last uh, session a little bit, you know, with uh, near death experiences, you know, that when they see the light, you know, they go they experience the light and they experience this powerful, you know, uh, energy of love that nothing on this, you know, uh, and now I'm not sure. I, I, I know I'm trying to, I'm trying to focus. So I'm not talking about 20 million things here, like what it is, you know, what what I'm actually wanting to address that that can actually be addressed. But um, I guess I guess the problem is is that you know <laughs> this was one of these days where I was running late and so I like started the lecture and I didn't get to read it really really well but it was again one of those lectures I was like glad I didn't because I kept feeling myself talking to the lecture and saying you know you're I've spent a lifetime like you know looking at my unconscious and, and it's like I don't want to be perfect anymore I like um and I I don't know. I guess I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I can say that's really helpful. I just. I felt like I just wanted to like address that. <laughs> this does happen to me um, periodically with this with the lectures where I feel like um, not, it's. Uh, yeah, I don't know. The thing is that the guide is some is somehow stern, or hectoring, or. 
Yeah, and, it, and it's like, instead of, you know, like, I feel like, I guess I, I always feel like at the core, uh, the core, we're all really looking, you know, want that we all want to express love. And that like, you know, that when you go underneath, like all the negative stuff, like at the core, there's love. I mean, this is how I feel about, I feel like the more I've gone through a path of self facing, you know, like to use the terms of path work, which I haven't done in the path work I've done in other things. I just feel like more and more I, I need to be told that, you know, it's like this core place is this, just this part that's just wanting to express love. I mean, one of my favorite lectures when I read the guide, the, the, the you know, the, the book, the guide lectures for self transformation was where um, the guy talks about um, that you know, we often talk about, you know, what the child's needs that didn't get met, you know, what they didn't get, what they didn't mm -hmm. get, that one of the biggest things is what they didn't get to give, that that wasn't being received, you know, that if the parents are not able to receive, and that, when I read that, that to me was like, I always quote that with people, because that was like, I remember like looking at that page and like, you know, my, my, and I was just like, my heart just went like, you know, it, it, it just, I just felt like that's like, I don't know, it just spoke to so much for me, you know, and I, I just, I guess I just feel like it for, for me, just personally, that I just feel like everything, every block in my life is about this incredible love being blocked and not being received, you know, that I, I feel myself as, you know, when I get closer and closer to my center, I feel myself as, this expansive love, you know, just like, like, and it's like weird to even say this. I'm like, okay, I'm telling all these people that I think I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, and, and like all my blocks with performing, because that's like the biggest pain in my life, you know, that I want to share my gifts, I want to share my music, I want to share my, you know, what I write be, to make the world happy and loving. And, you know, it's like, you know, I mean, which is not to deny that there are things I want to that are hard to look at. I'm not saying that, you know, I, clearly, I mean, I'm like, I related to what Stephen said about the Ukraine. You know, somebody posted a video uh, showing the beauty of U Ukraine, and I knew the next thing that was coming was the destruction. And I said, I'm not going to watch this because I can't watch it. You know, I don't want I don't want to see I can't see it, you know, I know I know what's happening i'm not going to expose myself to it. You know, so I think that's part of what I guess what i'm why i'm talking and what I need to express is that I feel like. I, I have to like it's a positive thing for me to shield myself against you know critic against self criticism, so I think that's maybe why you know what what i'm needing to express is that you know i just see how important that is. I've spent a lot of time with shame and self-criticism and, you know, I just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, there's, you have to alternate in approaches, I think. And I do think that the path work has in the past been um, deficient in acknowledging the time that people should spend to rejoice and celebrate in their divinity and in our higher selves. Uh, that's a very important part of the picture, I think. What do you think, Marion? Thank you, Alan, for saying that because something that I have more and more close in my face is not having any authorities outside of myself. None. All within. We have that lecture, higher self, lower self, and mask. I am never without my higher self. And what helps me when I am looking at my wall or anything else is to look, I do that exercise. I call it the tools in the toolbox. If I'm buying my grandson, the oldest one who just turned 21, a birthday gift, whatever, I want him to like mine the best. You know, I've got to do my higher self, lower self and mask before going to the little gathering to give him the present. It is just a tool in my toolbox. It's not an indictment of me. It is so liberating. It is so liberating that I've come to find that love is not an emotion, it's not a feeling, that it is the highest form of love is right action. And right. love is an aspect of the divine, which we have the, the lecture even, you know, um, love, power, serenity. 
You know, these are the triad nature that we all have. And that love is not the same of, Alan, I love you <laughs> as an emotion. And yet when I stand back and I can connect with, yes, yes, my love does flow. And so it's looking at the pathwork, not as my final authority, but what is in there? Even the guide said, I remember years ago, and I'm paraphrasing, they are not perfect. This came from the guide. And the guide, I this, this I can use this word that I'm not making, uh, this is not paraphrasing. I remember the guide using the word of uh, skepticism, healthy skepticism. It's healthy. That does not mean criticizing or putting down or anything like that. So it's like questioning because we all have looked that have been in through, through helpership at the phases of the lectures, the early phase, the middle phase, when Eva met John, we brought in the uh, core work. It's helpful to know the history of some, you know, the path work. For me, I'm not saying about anybody else, but it's there, but everything is in there that I need. Not, ex you know, there's other places I go for other clarification. So it's not making it my authority outside of myself. And I have had to look at everybody, you know, my kids, my parents, my grandkids, everybody that I make an authority, the government. This is detachment is one of the most, we cannot do that alone. It's one of the deepest transformation processes we can have is detachment because it's not indifference. And it's what brings forth actual true love is being detached from all outer authorities. So that's why the pathwork lectures is such a treasure. Because what you said, Alan, you feel like, Chris, I did too when I was reading. It was like, could you tone it down? Yeah, I want to tell the guide, could you tone it down a little bit? Not be so harsh, you know? But <laughs> I, I tell that to every author of every spiritual teaching because I tend, I felt so criticized in growing up. So that stands out to me, you know? So it's part of my images. So anyway, I'll end it with oh, that. That's a very good because, point. Yeah, yeah, thank if you. If you react against the criticism of the guide, then perhaps it's a, it's a trigger for an image. That you might have. Yeah. It's not to I'm say. Thank you, Alan and Marianne, because both of you express that. And you know, to me, I agree more with Tracy that whenever something triggers you or gives you that funny feeling, those butterflies or like, aha, something is steering in me, you might not even know what it is. You might not know what it is because I had it recently. A lot of, should I say, nasty uh, shit is hitting the fence since I started Pathwork. Because, you know, you get in there and you start being honest. And like Alan's saying, we all got to get naked. So whenever something starts steering in me and I get that quasi and un strange feeling in my belly, that means something is due for cleanse and something is coming up. And unfortunately, that something is usually excruciatingly painful. So I think you ladies have a right to defend yourself if you're not ready to break through there because like he's saying sometimes it can kill you you cannot do it all at once these are extremely painful feelings they're right behind the wall and there is a reason why you put up this wall because shit that spins is behind that wall and it's connected probably with the pain of your childhood but it's not it's the wrong conclusion it's the images your parents criticize you your parents uh, like uh, ellen was saying couldn't receive from you that is a beautiful thing. I know I had the same thing. My mother couldn't receive. She was starved for love. She couldn't receive it. And she would punish you if you tried to give her too much. So, but all of this is frozen into an image. That pain of a child that couldn't give. That pain of a child that wasn't loved. That pain of the child that was criticized. And when this quasi feeling, oh, like Tracy is saying, some racist things like, well, I have black boy and white boys, so I am cool now, right? So... Where does this come from? You know, I must have been a racist in one of those lives since I'm feeling good having both. And I sympathize with all of this, but I think that basically you're protecting yourself against releasing something that's too painful for you to face up fully. You're, you're talking about you? You're talking about yourself or you? I don't know what I'm you're using the word me, you. But I'm oh, also, okay, okay. I'm because you kept me, saying you. You kept saying you. That's. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wanna... Yeah, I'm, I'm also referring to both of you saying, oh, I feel criticized by the, because I recently had a situation at work when I was extremely harshly criticized for a very small mistake. 
and literally it felt like they were kicking me around like a dog. I literally, I got three managers from the CEO to the, you know, the main manager of the company, giving me half an hour beating party for a mistake that I made. And I was devastated. I was literally crumbled. I like, I couldn't sleep for two weeks. And then I said to myself, what is it? What is this image? And that image came uh, that I am not competent enough, but also an image came that this is my substitute family and I want to be praised at work for being excellent at what I do, being smart. And even with my desire, you know, to be special, to be, and I, and I figured, oh my God, you know, I am making some emotional mistakes here because I am looking for approval and acceptance and stuff like that in the wrong place. I didn't get it as a child and I'm trying to get it now at my work. And some, some very painful feelings came, extremely painful. So I think I hit the wall where I had something like, okay, you know, um, demanding that I'm so good, you have to love me. I am so good, you know, you have to accept me. I am so good, you have to reward me because I didn't get it in my family. And they were like, hell no, we are work. You know, we're gonna kick you around. We don't give a shit about your images. But my images came up saying, you know, there is the pain to be felt for unfulfilled needs from childhood. There is extreme pain that was buried behind that wall. And that's a, that's a wall of protection from extreme pain saying, I was deprived as a child. I didn't get what I needed. I wasn't praised. I was criticized. I was called stupid by my mother just because my sister was genius and I was pretty. So she used to say, I have a beautiful daughter. I have a very pretty daughter and a genius daughter. So I always felt like she's saying, I have a stupid and pretty daughter and a smart daughter. So I always felt stupid. So all of those images hit the fan with this one job situation. And it was excruciatingly painful. It took me five weeks to get over it. So what I'm saying is I feel like Tracy really put a light for me on it, saying this is a world of protection. It's going to keep it until you're ready to release it and you will create the situation that's going to prompt for a release when you're ready. And I guess I must have been ready to create that situation at work, but I also sympathize with you, Lazy, feeling criticized. No, no, no. I, 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 please, wait, let, let me just interject. I was explaining something. I do not feel criticized. I'm saying a reactive me reacted. That's not who I am. I do not feel criticized. I'm saying what some of my over the years reaction was. I do not. So I don't want those words to go out that they are my words. I do not feel criticized. Well, I said that. Okay, Marianne, I, I don't want to actually talk to you or, or, or Harris. I, I wanted to share mine. And okay. to me, the world is the world of extreme pain. I mean, you know, they say in the path work that when you get on the spiritual path, cause and effect come faster in your life. In other words, attitudes you have manifest quickly, right? And that's maybe that's what you're experiencing now. You yeah, know? no, that's how I felt. And that's why this lecture, I think, is right on. And that's what I also was saying with... Um, Tracy, because after I felt that extreme pain, I said to myself, is there some wisdom in here? Is this is maybe some image that's uncovering? I don't know about the image, but certainly certain unfulfilled childhood needs were triggered and needed to be healed and needed to be brought to the surface and the pain needed to be felt because there is no other way to heal them, right? We're not children anymore. Nobody's gonna give us unconditional love and acceptance and treat us this way. We grown up, so this is past. And you have to feel mm -hmm. that excruciating pain of the child that was deprived. And that's what I felt for the last five weeks. And it actually released. And now I'm feeling okay with being a smart professional at work and having emotional intelligence with others, not being the hurt little child anymore. Sounds, sounds very important to me. Um, thank you. Anna Cecilia, I just noticed you're on, you're on the call. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Hello, my English is not very good. I was trying to ask in the chat if I am allowed to be here because I don't know if it's a closed group or open. Well, of course, one. you're allowed. Sure, anyone, anyone's allowed. Any Catholic <laughs> is allowed. To Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, you're from São Paulo. Yes, from São Paulo. I have, I have studied for many years 
the, the, the lectures, but I haven't been in a group since a long time. And I always wish to meet a group of people. I know we are also having Sao Paulo, but when I saw a message from your group, I was interested, but suddenly I want to be sure that's okay, that I'm here for the first sure, time. You're welcome. You're, you're okay. happy to have you with us. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we're all talking about the lecture, the wall within that lecture, lecture 48 or 47. Um, making recognition. Alan, can I just throw something in? Of course. So I want to follow up on something that Teresa is talk, sharing in a very personal way, which is that I think that what's, and maybe it's self, and forgive me if this is self evident, uh, part of what's going on with the wall is that it's we're, we're afraid that if we let ourselves see what's in there that it, that it's going to destroy us and so it's representative of death and picking up on what marion's saying it, it, in a way it is a death because we're we're releasing our uh, our mask and our and our and our false uh, positive image of ourselves right and, and so we're, we're getting into the, the truth. We, we need to stay connected to the truth of our own goodness, however it's manifest, but that part of us, the, uh, I'm sorry, it's the ideal, idealized self-image. Uh, part of the idealized self-image is destroyed when we face these limitations that take form as pings or uh, discomfort. Very nicely said. Very nicely said, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, Teresa. And actually, when I had that feeling, I actually felt like part of me is dying, literally. Like a part of me was dying. Yeah. That, and, that, you know, the, the, the reassuring aspect of that is that each death is, is also a rebirth. So to be born into, I, I don't, I kind of re, I renamed the lower self, the developing self. Um, so in order for the developing self to manifest, there, there do need to be deaths. And, 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 and as you say, they can be very painful. You know, when we face the truth of ourselves and, and let some of these um, idealized notions about who we are go, we, we're releasing them. We're, we're like the snake that's shedding its skin and it, and it can be painful. But the good news is that that we come into a better, a more broad and expansive of sense of ourselves and more loving, self-accepting uh, aspect of ourselves begins to take deeper root. I think we're lost. We lost you again, Tracy. No, I agree with you. And I think also part of the acceptance is accepting that lower self. Actually yes. seeing that this is, but because this part of my lower self came from immense pain. So you think that, oh, I'm gonna die if I go there, but basically all it is, it's unhealed pain. It's a lot of unhealed pain because most of the craziness that people do, I think it comes from pain. You know, like say they say hurt people hurt people. So the lower self to me is that very young, hurt, uh, unforgiven uh, and un, uh, you know, how should we say, unheard and unintegrated part of basically a whole bunch of hurts or misconceptions because of some painful things that we couldn't, um, you know, readily accept with our higher self. So to, to me, that part, that's why it's behind the wall because it's basically just raw pain. It's a raw pain, it's a lot of pain. You wouldn't hide something that was beautiful. And like when Ellen was saying about the higher self and the love, of course it's there. That's what we really are. We are like, and also the unity. When I look at the Ukraine and I try not to look as much either, I feel like I'm being bombed. I am being raped. I am being killed, you know, because we are connected. We are all souls. So we are all one in the sense that, you know, you look at these people, you feel like it's happening to me because if it's happening to anybody, it's happening to everybody. It's in everybody's conscious now. So. That's how I believe we are all one. We are all connected on the consciousness level and we are pure love and empathy and all of that from our higher self. So literally that's the higher self in action. You know, we are all one, we feel that pain. We, we would do anything, you know, but
But then that little hurt part of us, because it experienced such pain, wants to be better, wants to be smarter, wants to be, you know, it just doesn't want to go through that excruciating pain to be reborn healthy and saying there was a reason why I needed to go through this. It's like, why the fuck did I have to go through this, you know? And so it split off, it hid behind that wall, but I, I feel like most of this is just out of pain. It's excruciating pain that didn't allow us or, didn't, or we didn't have tools at that time to deal with it constructively. So we pushed it out there. And now as it starts coming out, it basically comes out for healing one way or the other. So you have to be the compassionate grown up to yourself. You have to be the parent you never had. You have to give that compassion and love to yourself, but you also have to feel that freaking pain. And it's a lot of it, you know, it needs to take its course. It took me five weeks to well, get over you, that pain. You, you did, you've demonstrated a great deal of courage and strength, Teresa. And, uh, and, and, and it's very generous of you to share this with all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah, it's important to remember the guy says the spirit world does not judge anyone. Kind of interesting. Um, at the end of the lecture, after the questions and answers, you human beings are always inclined to judge everyone alike. We cannot do so because everyone is of a different spiritual age. Everyone has reached a different stage of development in different respects of his or her personality. There are different basic factors to be considered. The characteristics, the strengths, and the tasks are different according to former incarnations. So I think it's always important to realize that the person that's doing the judging is really ourselves, you know, and from a spiritual point of view, from the guide's point of view, we're not judged. We're just requested or, or commanded in some sense to bring what's unconscious into the conscious. That's our job not to judge it, but to admit it, to bring it forward. And um, I always like the way the guy talks about how everything is so transparent in that realm, how the spirits can see everything so clearly, um, you know, and um, the guide also says in this lecture somewhere that other people can see this wall within us better than we can see it. And that's why when the guy talks about image finding teams, it's so important to be able to reveal yourself to someone else and, and seek their honest perceptions of who you are and what you're like, so that then you can reflect on, on who you are. You know, see the blind spots. Hmm. Yeah, I was wondering about the guide asks us to visualize the wall and, and how people see it. Um, I'm kind of imagining how I see that wall myself. Uh, that was interesting the way you saw it, Marion, that when you changed your perspective, it really wasn't that big. It was only about 10 feet wide. Right. It wasn't the China wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And also because my images are about I have to work so hard to take care of myself in my life. So if I'm always going to be climbing over that wall and I don't have a step ladder and nobody's shoulders to climb onto, you can imagine what that image is like, you know, it's an image. And that it's just so my wall, I remember drawing it, you know, those many years ago was very important, that tall, solid wall that went on forever from my perspective of child consciousness. Yeah. Does anyone else have an idea of how they visualize this wall? Do you have a picture of it? Did, did it did, did that phrase it, it, does that does that feel alive to you? The, that wall, what it feels like? Juan, what do you think? I am very, very bad uh, visualization for some reason. And, you know, it's, it's very hard for me to uh, really picture in my mind, uh, you know, concrete, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, a, a portable, uh, you know, um, form of, of what I have in my mind. Somehow I have trouble with that. That's why I, I do actually have a lot of trouble with, uh, you know, with a daily review because, um, 
uh, it's hard for me to like go back, uh, you know, during the day, what happened here and there and when and how I felt and this and that. Uh, because, uh, you know, once things happen to me, I just like deal with them right then and there and I move on. So like to go back and visualize how, okay, how I felt and, you know, then like, and, and have this idea or really connect with these uh, past feelings like this, unless, unless it comes uh, in, it comes to me intuitively, which is, you know, that I'm very good at, you know, the intuitively perceiving or sensing, um, you know, abstract things. With my intuition, I seem to be very good, but when it comes to um, like visualize uh, these things, um, I am very, I seem to be very, very bad with it. Um, with a wall, I, I, the only thing I can, I can see is just like, um, uh, yeah, I cannot even picture the whole thing. You know, like, what is it, a cement wall? I mean, what kind of wall is it? What is it made of? I mean, for me to picture, I'm saying, uh, you know, objectively, uh, is very, very difficult for me. So I just uh, kind of visualize it as some kind of obstacle, you know, that is, uh, uh, that where there is this uh, thing, you know, uh, this uh, um, uh, separation, uh, where behind that is uh, all this uh, negativity and, you know, hidden uh, um, ugliness that I, I don't really want to see or admit. Um, but I conform myself, you know, with just, as we were discussing earlier, uh, just really uh, feeling it and sensing it uh, and, and really observing it and, and just deal with it when, when I feel it, when I feel it, uh, you know, on the surface of my awareness. Then when I feel this anger, for example, or I feel fear or I feel resentment or I feel, um, you know, inferior uh, or I feel like, uh, uh, you know, insecure. And, you know, when I get these negativities, negative feelings, then I can just kind of like focus on them. And like I said, focus that, uh, you know, my la the laser beam of my conscious awareness on it. And then I know, and I have experienced that, just by the mere observation of it, uh, you start to uh, really dissipate. And uh, then of course I ask questions, why did I feel this way? Uh, why, what is it in me? What's in me that is causing these materials really to come to the surface of my awareness? What is hiding between, you know, behind it? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and then, um, then I just try to go deeper in that direction. Um, but as far as uh, like, you know, it's kind of visualizing the actual world to answer the questions, uh, I seem to have a lot of trouble with that, yeah. Thank you for asking, though. Oh, I, this is Miriam. I think you described it very well because your wall doesn't have to be a solid thing sitting there. I think you oh, really did that for us. You really did it. You? Yes. <laughs> it's well, it's different you. shapes. It's permeable. It's, it's hard for me to visualize the actual thing. You know, like this wall yeah. that I have in front. You know, that a, kind a of wall, thing. A wall can be like a veil. It can be permeable. It can keep changing. So I think oh, you yeah. did a very good description. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you, Juan. Hi. My wall uh, actually is uh, I can visualize things quite nicely, but <clears throat> my wall is uh, tightness in my chest, shallow breathing, and um, just um, feeling that I don't exist, that I'm just walking through this planet really not existing at all and i know that's the wall that i put up so that's my wall interesting whoa interesting mm -hmm. one of the things alan that i wanted to mention though and maybe we can talk a little bit about that is that you know the part of the lecture uh that really struck me um you know this is on, on page three right with the guy i think it's very important because i feel that i i deal with this and uh and you know I, and of course i observe it in other people but that's needless to say right i mean um and it's this part of the last the last um paragraph on page three while the guy talks about uh this danger that is a danger there, you know, that this danger of when we, uh, and, and I think one of the, I think it was the, the Alan Ellen that, you know, mentioned something like this, that we, um, when we use the actual truth, the truth of something to really hide the negativity that we don't want to see. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and think, yeah, and, and I think uh, we see that in, I mean, myself, I see that a lot, you know, because we try to uh, basically use a good, reason or a good deed 
to hide, uh, you know, this other part in us, which we feel, which of course is an, it's an image of, you know, wrong conclusion and, and you know, generalization there. But we don't want to see, we expand up to a certain point. And then there is a point where we, where we stop. And it's like, okay, that's it. I don't want to go any further. I just don't want to feel any, you know, like Teresa was saying, I don't want to feel more pain. I felt it enough, you know, and then we stop right there. And then we start using, um, you know, this apparent, you know, uh, you know, apparent, apparent good to really hide, you know, this other part of ourselves that we don't want to face, that we don't want to encounter. So the guy describes that in the paragraph, on that paragraph, and then he goes on to the next page, page four, uh, to talk more, to talk further about it, and, and you know how this is a very, very, uh, um, you know, uh, danger actually that that we have to uh, be careful with, you know. You know, you see that you notice that. Yeah, we're talking about we're talking about misusing the truth. That, yes, exactly. I mean? Well, that's about dogma, right? Where people take a dogmatic point of view. Right. Yes, um, yes, yes. You defend against your feelings, and you basically find a way to justify what you're doing, um, mm. without without will it being willing to feel, you know, what you're what's going on. In other words, yeah. you're, you're still keeping things behind the wall that you don't want to face. But you're, yeah, not, yeah. you're not admitting that. Mm. Yeah, it, it kind of relates to the mask also because you kind of like put a mask o o over oh, yeah. this thing, right? I think that's definitely yeah. what it is. Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely yeah. what it is. Yes. Yeah, well, we, all, we have a long way to go, right? Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. There are, are a lot of ways. Or, Alan, yeah. or it can happen in a moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. We have a long way to go. And it can happen in a moment. That would be nice. That's one of the paradoxes, right, of the pathworks. That's one it happens, of the it happens in a moment. It's just that we don't know when, right? Actually, the guy describes the process. You know, we have to like really kind of like build on it. You know, it just it happens in a moment. I mean, that that maybe that uh, that I guess that peak, uh, but it's, it's an actual uh, you know uh, process that you know takes. Uh, Many, like as Alan was saying earlier, many, many incarnations, you know. So I think we're on the right path though, because we work. Yeah, and of course, you know, as 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 always is said in the in the lectures, we have to ask for help. Like the guide says, take your intent into your prayers, my friends. Ask God to help you first to see the wall and then give you the courage and humility to break it down. Yeah, that's one tool I use a lot, the prayer. I think it's so helpful. I think it's I so feel helpful. That, uh, it's so easy for me to forget to ask for help. I, I always find myself that I forget that I can I can ask for help. God, so important. But that means giving up the ego, right? Because the ego doesn't want to acknowledge that you need help. And the ego also doesn't want to feel the grace that you receive when you ask for help. Because Unfortunately. Because prideful and wants to believe it, it does everything. Right, that's how you see it. Mm. He wants to do it all on his own, and, you know, and he can't. So he just runs it, it drives itself out, and then a the whole bunch of trouble comes from that. <laughs> so does anyone else have any thoughts before we do our meditation? Usually we do some meditation at the end of our, our discussion. Mm. Any ideas, thoughts about the questions at the end of the lecture? I like how the guide, the question, when does a must end and a duty start? The must or the compulsion is always a result of untruthful, mixed and confused motives. Duty is something entirely voluntary. If you fulfill a duty without compulsion, you do so because you decided it. It may be something that life seems to force upon you, but once you recognize that you cannot live entirely as you would choose, that life brings situations and predicaments which one has to accept, whether one likes them or not. The healthy attitude is to say yes to life as it is. That seems to be a description of the egoless attitude, right? Mm -hmm. The ego might fight a duty or might not want to take it on, but when the, the greater self accepts the fact that life has responsibilities and you would voluntarily accept them, then I think you go beyond the ego. Says, life's imperfections have to be accepted in that spirit. 
This also includes things that become your duty. He who constantly rebels against these imperfect conditions, even though the rebellion may be quite unconscious, acts against his will like a child who is forced to obey. The mature attitude is the free one. The, this real kind of freedom does not mean that one can always do exactly as one pleases, but that one accepts the necessary with a willing spirit with an inward yes. In other words, the borderline is in the very fine distinction between saying yes to an imposed or inevitable duty or struggling against it and being forced to accept it against one's will. That's pretty deep, you know? Because here we are on earth and we have to accept that we have some responsibilities, but we have to voluntarily accept them, right? Beyond the ego. Yeah, I like also, Alan, that, that, uh, that paragraph before the last, I think you read some of it, but I think it's so important in that one because it really, um, I think, uh, resonates with a lot of us. Because, you know, where the guy says, uh, for a long time, you may delude yourself into believing that all the mishaps in your life are due to injustice or to malice or to the fault of others. But there is a limit as to how long you can go on believing that. Eventually, the situation must arise when you are cornered in your own errors, when you are confronted with the undeniable fact that you yourself have produced the misery and that that will well we wake you up and make you change your course. Isn't that cool? Right, <laughs> that is the essence of the path work, right? I mean, that is exactly that is so, that is so important to the core of the path work. You know that, but, but it's interesting that, that a paragraph I read before, you know, here we are, we've made certain choices that, we, that we've arrived at certain points in our lives. And there's an, there, there's an inevitability about the challenges we face because of the choices we made. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we can't make choices which change things in the future. But we have to accept the duties that we have now upon us because of what happened in the past, because of the karma that existed, because of the tasks that we undertook in our life. But okay. when you right, that paragraph that you read, obviously, fundamentally we are responsible for our circumstances um and it's not to be blamed it's basically to acknowledge the reality of, yeah. of our tasks and our and the karma that that um exists yeah and i really this is so lovely <laughs> the guide i referred to this earlier when we see a human being we know at once by the forms in the soul by the pictures within, whether he or she is going entirely according to the soul's plan or partly so, deviating a little bit, but not enough to lose course entirely or whether entirely away from his or her own road and thus producing and slowly building up the conditions that finally appear like tragedy, but that are nothing but the creation of nature's healing forces. Yeah, there's beautiful. Life. Another lecture in which the guy that describes and explains how when somebody basically cannot fulfill their task on earth, they may create um, a way to die because they, they don't have a way to proceed any, any longer to create, to uh, fulfill their task. Yeah, that's another lecture. Anyway, um, uh, brothers and sisters, so unless we have any more thoughts we can do our meditation. Um, I will read a paragraph and then we can meditate. Does anyone have candles? I know Tracy, you have a candle, don't you? Hold on a second, we're putting it on. Okay. Yeah. Joel's getting it. Just one. No, it's got three, three ways. Oh, yeah. Okay.
well, my friends, I want to give thanks for the opportunity that we have to be together. And um, I think we all have to be thankful that we're incarnated here on the planet Earth. We have the opportunity to grow and develop because the guide says that the ability to grow and develop is so much greater here on Earth than in the spirit world. Because here we have the veil drawn over our perceptions. And here we have to grapple with our lower selves and our mask. And we can't see the beauty of the higher self that we see in the spirit world. So we have to confront our negativity and uh, our, uh, our impulses to hurt and be cruel, our belief in our victimhood and these things we have to confront. And for that reason, we can make so much progress here on earth. So I will read a one paragraph and then let's have our 15 minute meditation, okay? Um, yes. Let's meditate on finding the wall within and having the courage to bring what's on the other side of that wall uh, into our consciousness. Make constant and detached observations of your daily reactions. Find your attitude toward them and learn from them to find what lies behind them. This in itself is already a curing agent to a large degree. Furthermore, by doing all this without haste, without tension, but with steady perseverance, you will see all the wrong conclusions that are connected with such attitudes. The important thing is then to think these conclusions through, to see why and how they're wrong and what the right, what the right conclusion would be. Cultivate this process of questioning and observe how the emotions which works slower than the brain mechanism, still adhere to their old patterns. Then these emotions will begin to change gradually, at first almost imperceptibly. This is the only way, my friends. All right, so we'll have 15 minutes to meditate on these words.